Hello, and thanks for joining us for our first of two sessions for this advanced training on pre and post fire monitoring. My name is Amber McCullum, and I'm joined by my colleague Juan Torres Perez. We will also be joined by two colleagues from NASA's DEVELOP program um, for the Q&A session for session two. So um, look forward to having them on with us as well. For this training, we have two sessions, each being three hours long. And the first is today on January 18th, and the second is on Thursday, January 20th. These sessions will consist of a lecture, a hands-on exercise, and a question and answer session. And then we're going to have some lab time where myself and our other instructors will remain online to ask questions as you complete the exercises in this training. You can find all the course materials on the website listed here, including the exercise documents for this session. We actually have two exercises for this session. Um, there are also two prerequisites for this training. First, um, it's really important to have an understanding of the basics of remote sensing, um, and our course on the fundamentals is listed here. Also, it's recommended that you have attended or watched the materials from the training we held last summer, um, which was a really extensive training on the remote sensing of fires. And I will note that some of the lecture slides from today's session will be a review from that training, um, but we will also be going in um, much more depth than we did in that training. I also encourage you all to ask questions along the way as we go through this lecture and as we go through the exercise. Um, so you can add your questions into the Q&A and we will get to those at the end. Um, and we've also included our emails here um, if you have additional questions that we don't get to um, with the Q&A or with lab time. For this series, we ha will have one homework assignment um, and the link to, to uh, view and complete the homework will be made available um, during our next session. And this will be uh, due by Tuesday, February 3rd. The homework will be a Google form that you need to submit online. So if you attend all of the sessions, so today's session and Thursday's session, and complete the homework by February 3rd, you'll receive a certificate of completion. And these do take a while to process, so do please be patient with those. Um, give us a couple of months to get those um, out to you and you'll receive the certificates via email um, after a few months after this training has concluded. So as I mentioned, this series will consist of two sessions. And during this first session, we're going to be focusing on pre-fire monitoring. And then in the second session, we're going to focus on post-fire mapping. And both sessions, as I mentioned, are this is an advanced training. So we're going to have some online um, interactive hands-on exercises. So today, we'll be looking at a few different web tools for monitoring pre-fire conditions. and then. Um, next session, we're going to focus on the use of Google Earth Engine for post-fire um, mapping. Here are the learning objectives for this training series. By the end of the training, you should be able to identify land cover and climate variables related to wildfire risk, assess and display geospatial wildfire risk data layers, and then um, in the next session, we'll be creating a burn severity map using satellite imagery and also calculating the burned area um, using our, our Google Earth Engine examples. So I want to remind you all um, that in order to complete next session's exercise, you will need a Google Earth Engine account. And if you haven't already, um, make sure to go to the link here and sign up at, for an account. Um, you can also find this on the training website. Um, Earth Engine accounts are free and you don't need to have a Gmail in order to sign up, but they do recommend that you use your work or institutional email. Um, you can also just Google search Google Earth Engine account sign up and you'll, you'll find instructor instructions on, on how to do this. Um, if you don't have an account ahead of time, no worries. 
Um, you can follow along and just watch me go through um, the, the scripting portion of our training. And then you can, you'll have access to the code for later. So you can go on and, and run through the exercise at a later date as well. Um, but it is encouraged because we do have lab time for this training to sign up for that account and, and take advantage of the time that we'll be on together. Throughout this webinar series, we will focus on two case studies to illustrate the concepts and for our hands-on exercises. The first case study will focus on a wildfire outbreak in British Columbia that occurred last summer after the hottest day ever recorded in Canada. The second case study will focus on multiple fires that occurred throughout Bolivia in 2020 that impacted various ecosystems um, such as wetlands, savannas, and portions of the Amazon rainforest. And we'll discuss these in a little bit more detail um, later on in this training series. So here is the agenda for the first session. First, we will review the pre-fire biophysical and climate conditions. Then we will highlight pre-fire data and tools such as land fire, the global wildfire information system, and um, Severe's Global Service Catalog. Then I will guide you through portions of the hands-on exercise, mostly in um, Google, uh, in um, Climate Engine for today. After the lecture portion of the session, we will have time for a question and answer portion. And as I mentioned, I'd ask your questions along the way. Um, and I also wanted to mention, we will post the questions and answers on our website as a PDF document after the end of this training. Um, give us about a week or two to get that um, posted, but you'll have that for reference. So if you asked a question and we provided some links, you can go back and use that document um, at a later time. And, and again, this training is a little unique. Um, we haven't done this um, very much with our RSET trainings, but we're going to stay on for some lab time um, if you have questions along the way as you work through the exercises at the end of today's session. Okay, so let's now get into a review of our pre-fire conditions related to uh, climate as well as the landscape. And again, I wanna mention that some of these slides are a review from our recent training that we conducted last summer. So there are many variables to consider when monitoring a region prior to a wildfire. These can be broken up into two primary categories. So monitoring the climate conditions in the months, weeks, and days preceding a fire. And these conditions are ephemeral and likely to change rapidly. And these include variables such as precipitation, temperature, soil moisture, humidity, and winds. Um, so these are the, the pieces that we're gonna focus on first. Um, and then the second category of pre-fire conditions are the landscape and vegetation features. While these variables can change, some of them are more fixed, such as topographic features like slope. And this can affect how fire spreads. Other variables like vegetation structure and health can also change and lead to increased risk of fire occurrence. But these tend to change um, a little more gradually than things like the, the climate conditions. Um, this is all also to say that there are many variables you can monitor to assess wildfire risk. And this is not going to be an extensive list. We're not gonna talk about every single variable you could monitor but give some examples of, in general, the types of, of variables that we, we tend to look at when we think about increased risks in a region or a, a certain landscape. And um, these systems can be really simple or they can be really complex. And a lot of times it just depends on your region. Um, so do keep that in mind as we go through um, these examples. So the first I wanted to mention here is the effect of precipitation on wildfires. And this is interesting because it can be twofold. On one hand, increased precipitation leads to increases in vegetation growth, in particular with forest understory. 
This can then increase the fuels available for fire in, say, a subsequent dry season. On the other hand, decreased precipitation leads to dry fuel, which will more readily burn. Therefore, it's important to closely monitor the precipitation patterns in the region that you're interested in. Um, and you can see increases in, in fires occurring with both increases and decreases in precipitation in different ways. Increases in temperature have led to increased fire activity throughout much of the world. Positive land surface temperature anomalies are being observed more frequently due to climate change. This was a driving factor in our first case study with the Lytton fire in Canada that occurred after an anomalously high temperatures, um, the highest temperatures ever recorded in Canada. Um, and this has also been a primary factor in many of the recent wildfire outbreaks that we've seen in the Western United States. Soil moisture patterns, similar to precipitation patterns, can also have varied impacts on wildfire outbreak potential. In wetter regions, drier than normal soil moisture can dry out fuels, which can lead to wildfire risk. In drier conditions, uh, wetter than normal soil moisture can also lead to increased vegetation growth that can fuel fires. So the effects of these variables are oftentimes very dependent on your ecosystem and other dynamics at play. Relative humidity is the ratio of the amount of moisture in the air to the amount of moisture necessary to saturate the air at the same temperature and pressure. And this is expressed as a percentage. Relative humidity is important because dead forest fuels and the air always exchanging moisture. So low humidity takes moisture from the fuels, the vegetation, and fuels in turn take moisture from the air when humidity is high. Light fuels such as grass and needles gain and lose moisture quickly with changes in relative humidity. So when the relative humidity drops, fire behavior tends to increase because these fine fuels become drier. Heavy fuels, on the other hand, respond to humidity changes more slowly. To see significant changes in heavy fuel moisture, there must be significant moisture, usually from more than just, say, a single storm. So again, um, these dynamics are complex. Winds at the time of a fire outbreak can have significant impact on fire spread. When wind speeds are high and fuels are critically dry, wildfire spreads very quickly. We often see this in California as wind speeds can get extremely high, in particular in high elevation regions with steep topography such as the Sierra Mountains. In general, wildfires normally travel up to six miles per hour in forests and 14 miles per hour in grasslands, but this can dramatically increase when the wind picks up. In some cases, fire managers have seen fires moving up to 40 miles per hour, as we saw in California with many of our wildfires in 2020, with um, fires like the Glass Fire, for example, where winds topped up to 70 miles per hour. As I mentioned, there are various methods to assess pre-fire conditions. And one in particular is the assessment of fire weather. Fire weather is the use of meteorological parameters that we've discussed here, things like relative humidity, wind speed and direction, and soil moisture, to determine whether conditions are favorable for fire growth and smoke dispersion. You may have heard of the term red flag warning which is issued in the United States when weather conditions are favorable for a fire outbreak. These conditions vary by region, but a red flag warning is the highest alert that can be issued when there is low relative humidity, strong winds, dry fuels, and the possibility of dry lightning strikes or any combination of the above. 
As we've seen in recent years, climate change is a major factor that has already led to an increase in wildfire season length, wildfire frequency, and burned area. The wildfire season has lengthened in many areas due to factors including warmer springs, longer summers and dry seasons, and drier soils and vegetation. Similarly, climate change threatens to increase the frequency, extent, and severity of fires through increased temperatures and drought. Earlier spring melting and reduced snowpack resulting in de decreased water availability during hot summer conditions. These trends of longer wildfire seasons and larger wildfire size are predicted to continue as more frequent and longer droughts occur. The figure here shows estimates of burned area in the Western United States back to 1984 with the red bars, alongside temperature anomalies with the black line, where you can see major increases in, in both in the recent decade. Okay, so now let's move on to the landscape and vegetation properties that can affect pre-fire conditions. As I mentioned earlier, these landscapes features can be fixed, such as elevation, slope, or they can be variable, such as vegetation type, extent, health, structure, and moisture content. So now we're gonna go through a few of these examples in more detail. Elevation affects fire behavior by influencing the amount and timing of precipitation as well as exposure to prevailing wind. Elevation also affects the seasonal drying of fuel. In lower elevations, um, and generally where more private land is located, fuels tend to dry out earlier in the year because of higher temperatures and lower precipitation. The opposite is true for fuels at higher elevation. There is also a tendency for more lightning strikes and subsequent ignitions at higher elevations. Slope, that's how steep or inclined the land surface is, impacts the spread of fire. Increased slope often equates to faster fire spread. Fires tend to spread faster up a slope than they do down a slope. As heat rises in the front of the fire, it more effectively preheats and dries upslope fuels, making for more rapid combustion of vegetation. Now, aspect or the direction of the slope affects how much solar radiation the site receives, and it also affects the vegetation type. South and west facing slopes tend to have less vegetation and lighter fuel loads, particularly in low elevation forests. South slopes receive much higher solar radiation and are warmer, so fuels tend to dry out sooner and more thoroughly during the fire season. In contrast, north slopes have more vegetation and hence heavier fuel loads. North slopes are cooler and more shaded, thus delaying the drying of fuels long into the fire season. But because of their higher fuel loading heavily vegetated north slopes can experience more severe wildfires. So it's important to note that we are speaking from a northern hemisphere perspective when we talk about these different um, aspects and the effects on um, solar radiation and um, vegetation. Lastly, landscape features like narrow and wide canyons, ridges, and saddles can dramatically affect fire behavior. These features can change prevailing wind patterns by funneling air, increasing wind speeds, and thereby intensifying fire behavior. Fires on lateral ridges, those coming off of a main ridge, can burn in any direction and can be affected by wind moving up through the canyons and saddles. Other features, including rock outcroppings, streams, rivers, lakes, and roads, act as fire barriers and can be used as anchor points for developing fuel outbreaks. And we will see this with our um, Canada example, in particular when we go through the exercise in the next training, um, when we think about uh, the location of the river and the wildfire spread. 
And firefighters often take advantage of these natural and man-made features in attacking and suppressing wildfires. Additionally, the vegetation conditions can also greatly impact wildfire ignition and spread. Remote sensing can be used to assess these conditions for large regions. In terms of assessing vegetation type and extent, land cover classification is a really popular approach. As you might already know, land cover classification is the process of grouping similar pixels in remote sensing imagery based on land cover classes like forest, shrubland, agriculture. How specific each class is depends on your analysis of the imagery and your access to ground truth data. You can also see on the right this land cover map of Sub-Saharan Africa, and this provides pretty specific classes, allowing for more fine scale characterization of the, the fuel type and extent. The scale of the classification, whether general, vegetation type, or even plant species, is typically left up to the fire analyst and whatever level of classification works for the management and decision making. Mapping different vegetation types is really important for fire risks since fuel behavior varies depending on the type of vegetation present. For example, forests contain more biomass to sustain burning, but shrubland vegetation might ignite more easily. Differentiating fuel types and mapping their extent is a great way to start understanding vegetation-based fire risk within a study area. And I've also um, linked two RSET trainings that provide much more detail about um, land cover classification. Um, this was a, one that we did recently in Google Earth Engine, so um, doing land cover classification. And then the other was forest mapping and monitoring with SAR data, where we also actually provided a Google Earth Engine example here. Um, but we won't get into some of these next variables about um, the, the dynamics and characteristics of um, forests and vegetation that you can do with SAR mapping, but, but there's the, the link there to, to take a look at that training. It was a really well done training um, by some of my colleagues as well. Vegetation stage and health are also really important. Unhealthy vegetation typically has a higher percentage of drier biomass like dead leaves or drying branches, and this makes the unhealthy vegetation easier to burn. The stages of vegetation can also dictate the amount and types of fuels available for fires. An important component of the vegetation stage is um, thinking about phenology. So phenology is the science of seasonal variation in plant development, um, such as blooms, buds, and crop growth. The figure here describes the seasonal change in NDVI. Measuring seasonal variation in vegetation using land surface phenology from remote sensing data products can demonstrate changes in fuel loads over time. Now we won't be going into much more depth about phenology, um, but we provided a link to uh, another recent RSET training that we focused just on phenology. Um, and you can monitor these types of things um, using various vegetation indices, like a few of the, these I've given here as an example. These vegetation index anomalies are often used to show current vegetation patterns relative to long-term averages. So we think about these um, as the difference from average. You can use any vegetation index that works best for your region, as long as you have enough data to establish some kind of long-term mean. And this can be calculated by subtracting the long-term mean from the current value and is oftentimes done on a monthly basis. For example, if the anomaly is negative, this indicates that the vegetation is less green than normal, which may be indicative of drought-like conditions or abnormally high temperatures that impact vegetation health. For example, the VIRS NDVI anomaly map shown here um, outlines negative anomalies in Northern California on July 3rd of 2020, prior to a large fire outbreak that occurred in August. This NDVI anomaly map supports this point as vegetation was likely drier 
due to low moisture and high temperatures. Vegetation moisture is an important factor con to consider when discussing fuel ignition and burning. Low moisture in your vegetation acts as drier fuel and will contribute to the spread of the fire as we've, we've been talking about here. Dry vegetation can also influence the moisture of the surrounding environment, providing more favorable conditions for fire. One method of assessing vegetation moisture is via fuel moisture content, which is the ratio of leaf water content to dry leaf matter. This can also be quantified indirectly via evapotranspiration, which is the sum of evaporation from the land surface plus transpiration from plants. There are also relevant vegetation indices that can provide more information about moisture content, such as the normalized difference water index, the normalized dry matter index, and the evaporative stress index, which we'll go over a little bit here. In the case of wildfire, the canopy height and density influence dynamics directly as fuel. And this all links to the vegetation structure. So measuring density is important since dense vegetation can allow fires to spread over a greater extent and more quickly. Canopy height provides useful information about ladder fuels or those fuels that can allow for fires to spread vertically into the canopy, like short, shorter trees, lower hanging branches, or shrubs. Height and density also influence fire dynamics indirectly through their influence on other variables in the fire in environment. For example, three-dimensional fuel structure has been shown to have an influence on fuel moisture regimes, with the forest floor being consistently more moist under dense canopies. Estimation of density, height, and overall 3D structure can also be useful for biomass assessments where biomass is considered uh, as a means to assess fuel loads. And I mentioned our recent training on the use of synthetic aperture radar or SAR, um, and you can also use LIDAR as a mean to, ask, to assess these factors. And so we won't get into this um, piece for this training, but it is an important piece and um, the use of SAR data is, is really valuable here. For canopy height, Forest stand height is a frequently used metric. It provides an estimate of the average height of trees in a forest stand, and it acts as a useful indicator of forest age and structure, especially in the assessment of above ground biomass. And this, this really makes it useful for that pre-fire stage assessment of fuel availability. And as we mentioned previously, mapping vegetation height over a forested landscape has been done um, with, for example, the maps you can see here on this slide, and also provides information about ladder fuels. And again, I'll, I'll re reference the uh, RSET SAR training we did recently. And finally, canopy dens density can impact fire spread. Now, when we talk about canopy density, we're typically referring to structural elements like openings in vegetated areas, single trees separated from stands, and clumps of trees with adjacent or interlocking crowns. Closer together, denser vegetation provides consistent and more accessible fuel loads for fires, influencing their ab ab ability to spread across a landscape. When mapped, like the figure on the right created using LIDAR data, dense and sparsely vegetated areas are identifiable over the entire landscape. Landscape scale mapping like this can help us identify areas where fires may spread more readily or have greater access to fuels. So now I will briefly review a few um, fire danger assessments. And as I mentioned early on in this lecture, outlining fire danger can be done in a really simple way or it can be done in a very complex way. Um, and there are a variety of methods to assess fire danger. And whatever you do in your region can 
can really vary depending on the type of data you have available, um, what metrics your decision-making activities or entities use for um, making decisions on risk. Um, so these can vary widely and there are just a few examples out there. So let's start with two definitions um, using this example from the UN Food and Agriculture Organization's forestry program. Um, and fire danger here is a general term used to express an assessment of both fixed and variable factors of the environment that determine the ease of ignition, the rate of spread, difficulty of control, and fire impact. In other words, where a fire can start and how it will move. Fire danger rating is a component of a fire management system that integrates the effects of selected fire danger factors into one or more qualitative indices of current protection needs. Fire danger rating systems were developed as tools to provide a uniform starting point for fire management agencies to prepare and respond to fire. The picture here is a public fire danger rating sign um, from Thailand. And signs like this are common throughout the world where fire danger rating systems have been established. In practical terms, fire danger is about tracking static and dynamic elements of the fire environment. And these include a lot of those variables that we've already discussed today. So topography, um, that static part of fire danger, uh, all, all other things be equal, fires spread faster uphill as the slope bends the fuel towards the flame, um, and preheating those fuels. Also, fuels on sun-facing slopes also dry out faster than in the shade. Second, fuels, which we've discussed, and fuels, as I mentioned, are part of the static and dynamic aspect of fire danger. Fires start more easily in fine fuels, such as forest litter and grass. It's harder for fires to spread in live or matted grass than in in standing dead trees. There's also more fuel available to burn and produce smoke in forests compared to grass. Coniferous trees tend to be more flammable than broadleaf trees. And fire behavior also depends on fuel structure, the space between the trees, the connectivity of the landscape, the ladder fuel, for example. So these pictures so, show examples of fires in different terrains um, and you can see a low intensity fire spreading on the flat terrain in the top picture and a higher intensity um, fire in the um, more mountainous region here on the bottom. The last and the most dynamic element of fire danger is weather. So we talked about a lot of these parameters as well. Um, you know, weather can control the moisture content of dead fuels, um, and it can impact a lot of um, the ignition and spread of fires as well. Around the world, there are simple and complex fire danger rating systems. And here are a few of, of these examples. Um, we have the crossover concept, which is an ad hoc way of identifying dangerously dry conditions. When the situation is bad, um, when the temperature is high, um, higher than the relative humidity. Um, so this idea was developed from the um, experience of firefighters in North America. The next index was developed in Russia in the 1940s. This index goes up each day depending on the difference between the temperature and the dew point. And then finally, the US fire danger rating system um, characterizes potential fire starts and behavior for four different U.S. fuel types. It requires hourly observations of things like temperature, humidity, wind speed, precipitation, solar radiation, and then includes topography. Regardless of their complexity, all fire danger rating systems have a weather component. The Canadian Fire Weather Index System is an 
intermediately complex fire danger rating system. It is an accounting system to track the moisture content of different classes of dead fuels paired with simple models of fire behavior. So this requires daily measurements of things like surface temperature, relative humidity, wind speed, and precipitation. It's really designed to produce the maximum amount of information with the minimum amount of data input into the system. Because of its modest data requirements and adaptability, it's one of the most widely used fire danger rating systems in the world. Different indices have been adopted and calibrated for local fire environments, ranging from the boreal forests of Alaska to the dry forests of Southern Europe to the tropical rainforests of Fiji. But this is a really um, widely used and applicable danger rating system. And we'll actually be focusing on this for part of our example um, on the Canadian fire that we'll have um, later on in this session. So now with a brief overview of um, those conditions that we assess and some of the rating systems to look at fire danger, I wanted to talk a little bit more about our case studies that we'll be going through today um, and on Thursday and some online tools that you can use to assess pre-fire conditions in your region of interest. So as I mentioned previously, our first case study will focus on the Lytton Creek Fire in British Columbia, Canada. On June 30th, 2021, a large fire broke out near Lytton, BC after three consecutive days of record-breaking heat. The day before the fire began, temperatures reached over 49 degrees Celsius or 121 degrees Fahrenheit, the hottest ever recorded in the country. This streak of temperatures came as part of a record-breaking heat wave, which impacted much of the Western US and Southwestern Canada. The persistent high temperatures were the result of what is known as a heat dome, a mountain of warm air pressing down across a huge area. Um, there were high winds in this area that led to increased fire spread. The fires nearly destroyed the town of Lytton, and the fires affected many First Nations communities in the region. The figure on the top shows those temperatures um, that were recorded on June 29th with that record-breaking heat, along with um, some of the images below of the um, fire and the um, destruction in, in the town there. In order to assess some of the pre-fire conditions, primarily the climate conditions, we're going to be using Climate Engine for um, actually both of our exercises. So for this um, Canada example, as well as the Bolivia example. Um, climate Engine is a user-friendly in interface that actually is built off of the Google Earth Engine API um, to generate maps and time series of many different climate and remotely sensed variables. Um, you can create maps and time series of data all within the cloud without the need to download any of the imagery or the data. Um, so you can also download re results in a variety of formats, um, such as a CSV, or you can download um, the images and maps as uh, a PNG, things like that. Climate Engine is fully customizable for spatial and temporal analysis and provides a comprehensive set of variables that provide early warning indicators of fire impacts, of climate impacts for things like fire, for drought, for agriculture, and many other applications. Uh, one can select from the Make Map tab for quickly visualizing and analyzing variables um, for remote sensing. You can look at things like the Landsat Archive, MODIS, Sentinel-2, um, and you can also look at climate models and climate estimates from things like CHIRPS, Meritu, PRISM, GridMet, SNODAS, and many others. Um, all the data sets are visualized as a map layer on a Google map. Um, so it's, it's actually really easy to use and you don't need to understand coding or um, have any of that really um, in-depth knowledge behind this um, to, to do this analysis. For the Lytton Creek case, example, we're also going to be taking a look at the Canada Fire Weather Index that I mentioned previously. Um, and they have a, a series of maps and data available via Natural Resources Canada. 
as you can see here, and in, in what I mentioned a little bit of previously, was that the W, the FWI includes things like temperature, humidity, wind, and rain to generate three fuel moisture codes. These are generally represented as unitless codes in, instead of fuel moisture content. Um, they can be converted into moisture content and in fact are converted each day as part of the daily or hourly calculations. So this includes things like the fine fuel moisture code, which represents fuel moisture of forest litter um, in the fuels under the shade of forest canopy. It also includes the duff moisture code, which represents fuel moisture of decomposed organic matter underneath the litter and the drought code, um, which represents deep drying in the So then using these codes, um, the initial spread index and the built, built up index are, are calculated. Um, the initial spread index is the numeric rating of the expected rate of fire spread. It combines the effects of wind and the um, fuel moisture, fine fuel, fuel, fuel moisture code um, to assess the rate of spread. And then the built up index is a numerical rating of the total amount of fuel available for combustion. Um, so this index, as you can see, uh, is shown here in this map on the right, and it ranges from uh, zero to about 35, it can go higher. Um, it actually increases exponentially when you get to um, really anything over 30. And this indicates extreme fire risk. And so you can see here um, an example of the fire risk from July 1st, 2021. Um, in much of Canada, there's extreme risk. Here are two more examples of maps produced by Natural Resources Canada, including seasonal forecasts. Before and during the fire season, monthly forecast maps are generated at the beginning of each month. Forecasts are based on a 40 member ensemble of predicted monthly temperature and precipitation anomalies using two numeric weather prediction models. These maps include the forecast severity rating, which presents forecasted monthly or seasonal severity ratings. This map shows the predicted conditions un unadjusted for climatology. It also includes things like the average severity rating map, which presents a 30 year average monthly or seasonal severity rating. And this really shows the regional climate climatology of severity. And then, and then finally the forecast severity anomaly map which presents the ratio of the forecasted severity rating to the average monthly or seasonal severity rating. So this indicates which regions are predicted to be above or below the regional climatological average in the normalized form. So you have a lot of examples here and um, nice maps that are pre-generated um, for those of you interested in tracking um, fire in Canada. And, and uh, another nice resource from Natural Resources Canada is this interactive map. Um, within this map, you can display things like fire danger layer um, using the static maps like we showed on the previous slide, but you can also do some during and post fire monitoring and mapping. And while this training is not focused on actively burning fires, you can view them here and with many of the um, online tools for um, monitoring pre-fire conditions, they also include things like actively burning fires. Um, so a lot of times these are included in, in particular with the next system that, that we'll be mentioning. So the Global Wildfire Information System, um, we'll be taking a look at in both exercises. And um, as you may be aware, this is a joint initiative of the GeoWork program and Copernicus, which is the European service that delivers near real time data on a global level. And the real goal of GWIS is to provide a comprehensive view and evaluation of fire regimes and fire effects at the local level. Um, this builds on many ongoing activities and um, they have this really great um, viewer that we'll be taking a look at. And as I mentioned, they had 
um, they run sort of the gamut of uh, pre, during, and post-fire um, data available. So this is what the current situation viewer looks like. Um, they have fire danger forecasts, which is what we'll take a look at. What we're interested in here is this pre-fire um, danger. And then you can also view things like active fires from MODIS and VIRS, as well as burnt area um, after some time of the calculations are, are being conducted. Um, so this is a screenshot of what the viewer looks like at the time just prior to the start of the Litton fire. And here we have the ISI displayed with um, high values indicated in red. And, and when we start to take a look at this example, you'll see that the Litton fire occurred right in this area of, of really high risk. In our second case study example, we will focus on a large wildfire outbreak in Bolivia that occurred in the late summer of 2020. While fires are common in this region and are generally used as a tool for maintaining pastures and for clearing, crop, uh, clearing land for crops, um, the fires in 2020 expanded into really large regions and prompted the government to declare a state of emergency. There was a similarly large outbreak of fires the previous year in 2019 as well. And research has suggested that this may be related to a dry modulation of the Atlantic Multidecadal Oscillation or the AMO. And this uh, decreases rainfall in the region and increases temperatures. And this is again related to climate variability and potentially related to climate change as we see these oscillations um, being modified with these increased temperatures um, in our oceans. And several ecosystems were affected, including wetlands, savanna grasslands, and portions of the Amazon rainforest. And I will note that with these fires, the damage was not only limited to Bolivia, and there were large swaths of land in Brazil and Paraguay affected as well. Um, it was estimated that over 1.3 million acres of, of land burned um, during these, these large fire outbreaks. In this image here, you can see the number of fire detections in the Southern Amazon in 2020 by the fire type along the top and the cumulative number of fire detections for the average of 2012 to 2019, and then separately for each year um, from 2012 to 2020. And so here you can see um, in the figure on the bottom, the 2020 line is the blue line with the number of fire detections well above average. And so this is just an example of um, what we're seeing in, in these historic fire um, years with these um, real large increases in the number of fires as well as um, the area burned. While well, we will be using Climate Engine and GWIS for the uh, Bolivia example, we will also take a look at a tool created by Severe Amazonian. Severe is a joint USAID and NASA program, and Severe partners with countries and organizations in these regions to address critical challenges in climate change, food security, water, and related disasters. Um, they also focus on things like land use and air quality. And they use uh, satellite data and geospatial technology to co-develop innovative solutions through a network of regional hubs to improve resilience and sustainable resource management um, at a variety of levels, so local, national, and regional scales. Severe has this really large, diverse collection of user-tailored geospatial services that use NASA data as well as other Earth observations um, for a number of thematic areas. So one of these tools um, is the Global Fire Emissions Database or the GFED Amazon Dashboard. And while this also is primarily a tool for tracking actively burning fires, it can be used to assess fire forecasts along with Firecast, which I'll mention next. And it can be used to assess fire type and extent in the Amazonia region. So it's a really great tool um, that I encourage you all to take a look at and we'll be looking at briefly with our second exercise. And finally, I wanted to briefly mention Firecast. 
which is an international tool that acts as an analysis and alert system for developing near real time monitoring products via email to the users. These alerts include risk of fire within a user specified area, like protected areas or specific land cover areas or user defined regions. Alerts also include map images depicting the locations of fire risks or fires. The system is operated um, in many South American countries, Indonesia and Madagascar. So we'll take a look at the 2020 fire season forecast for Bolivia as it applies to the potential for large fire outbreaks in this region. So um, each year they do have um, fire season forecasts for countries and regions within countries that um, can be really informative um, for assessing fire potential. So in summary from today's lecture, there are many factors that contribute to fire risk, including climate variables like precipitation and temperature, as well as landscape characteristics like slope and vegetation density. Fire danger can be assessed using various climate variables and indices and can vary regionally. We also highlighted a few tools that can be used to assess pre-fire conditions, such as Climate Engine, GWIS, the Amazon Dashboard, and we'll focus on um, these for our hands-on exercise um, that we'll get to next. Here are some of the links to resources that we mentioned throughout this lecture. So again, I, I really encourage you all to um, use this as a resource. Uh, we'll be going through some of these as well. And you um, can uh, access this presentation um, on the, the course website too, so you can have these all for reference later on as well. Okay, so in the remaining time together for this training, we are going to have um, three interactive portions. So first, um, what I'll do is walk you through the steps of our first exercise for our case study example for the Litton fires in Canada. And you can either follow along with me during this exercise, or you can work on your exercise at the end of the session during the lab time. Then we'll have a period of time for um, question and answer session. So as I mentioned, I encourage you to add your questions along the way. Um, we'll have a designated time where I'll answer some of the questions. Um, and then after the, the brief Q&A period, um, the trainers, myself, um, my colleague Juan, um, will remain online for lab time. So during this time, we'll, we'll um, sort of be quiet for a little while, allow you all to work through the um, exercises at your own pace and ask further questions. Um, so during this time, we may type in um, our answers to your questions or um, if we have a lot of similar questions or people running into similar issues, um, we'll just pause and maybe pull up our screens and talk through um, some of these examples here. So um, this will really kind of just flow depending on how, what kind of questions you all have, the questions that are coming in now and um, how you all work through the exercise itself. As a reminder, here's our contact information for myself and my colleague Juan. Um, you can find all the information about the training, including the links to download our two exercises for today um, at the training website shown here. And also, I want to mention that um, with RSET, as many of you know, um, there's a wealth of different trainings and for topics available. So do, do please check out the RSET website for other trainings that may be relevant to the types of things that you want to do with remote sensing data. Um, and you can also follow us online at Twitter, and we have um, information on upcoming trainings and events um, located there. So now we're going to jump right into our first hands-on exercise, um, where we're going to be monitoring pre-fire conditions for the Lytton Canada example. All right, so for this first, Case study example, I mentioned we're going to focus on the, the Litten Creek fires in Canada. Um, and we'll be taking a look at three different websites. Uh, first, we're going to take a look at Climate Engine. Then we're going to take a look at the Canadian Wildland Fire Information System. And then we're going to take a look at the Global Wildfire Information System. 
Um, and we'll be going through Climate Engine for this example, as well as our other examples. Um, so I want to mention before I get started, you can follow along with me using the PDF of the exercise documents found on the RCEP training website, or you could just sit back and listen in and refer to those exercise documents later during the lab time. Uh, the exercise documents will take you through step by step all of the steps I will be going through. Um, so no need to, to try to keep up and follow along, um, but you can if you'd like. I will also mention that with Climate Engine in particular, um, it's best to use Google Chrome. Um, and when we start to generate some of the maps, especially when we look at um, difference from average conditions, it can take a long time to run the processing. And it really also depends on your bandwidth that you have, um, how great your internet connection is in your region. So um, if your map takes a really long time to load, you can always use the reset option and restart everything. But I just want to mention that here. I'll mention that again as we go through um, the, the example today as well. Um, so let's go ahead and jump right in. Uh, what you're seeing now is the Climate Engine main web page. Um, they've, they've just modified a, a few of these features here, um, but what we're going to take a look at is their research application. So if you come right up to the top here and click on Research App, you can learn a little bit more about the application and go to the app here. And when you first arrive to the Climate Engine website, uh, you'll be given an option to take a tour. And you can do this um, if, you, if it's your first time using Climate Engine. Um, feel free to, to go ahead and take the tour. We're not going to go through the tour because I'm going to step you through a lot of the, the pieces here. But um, you can uh, opt to not show this window again if you don't want to take the tour. We can just close that out there. And what we're first going to do is um, focus in on our location. So one great thing about Climate Engine is it's sort of using the, the uh, Google Earth as its uh, mapping application. So um, you can go in here and type in Lytton, Canada, and click on Center Map. And this will take you automatically to our region of interest. Along the top of the map, you have a lot of different uh, options for the features. Um, one of those is under map, you can change your base map. So you can go ahead and under base map, choose something like the road map. Um, sometimes that's a little easier to view. You have some different options here. I'll leave it up to you. Um, but now you can clearly see the town of Lytton here. Um, you get a little bit of an idea of the landscape surrounding the region. Um, and now what we're going to do is use this left hand panel to um, select the variables of interest. Um, so we have the option here to make a map, which is what we're going to do. Um, you can also make a graph. We'll, we'll show a brief example of that later. Um, but here is where you really want to fine tune your variables of interest. So along the Make Map panel, um, you can go ahead and keep the type as climate and hydrology. The data set that we're going to take a look at is the NLDAS2 reanalysis. And when you click on the down arrow, you can see there are a lot of data sets available. So you have a lot of options here if you want to play around with this later. But we're going to look at NLDAS2. And we are going to take a look at the precipitation first. Um, so again, depending on the data set that you choose, you have different variables um, as your options. Um, under processing here, um, we're going to keep the total under the statistic. And for the calculation, we are going to take a look at the percent of average conditions. So go ahead and click that there. And then for the time period, you can select a custom date range, but it also has these pre-selected time periods. So things like the last June, July, August are really useful. And in particular for this example, because the fire happened um, in the, the last year. So then 
um, you can see the start and end date are automatically uh, modified to the last June, July, August. And because we are doing a percent of average calculation, um, this might take a while to process because what, what's going on behind the scenes is there is a climatological average established from 1979 to 2021. And then um, we're looking at the difference from average, the percent of average conditions in this example. So go ahead and click on get map layer and wait for the map to load. Okay, so now that the map has loaded, you can see that in this region, the precipitation is below average um, for, for the area. One great feature of Climate Engine is you have the option to get a value in a particular location. So you can click here on get value. And because we selected Lytton as our um, zoom in area, um, the geomarker will be located directly over um, the town. So then we can click on show value and we can see what the precipitation uh, percent of average was for the last June, July, August in this region. So here you can see the precipitation was um, nearly 40% of average. So um, well below average. We've included a few different optional steps within the exercise, and we've highlighted this in orange along the way. So um, here you'll notice that there are a few different optional um, steps where you can look at different time periods and take a look at the precipitation. Um, you can also compare various drought indices um, in this region to reflect other climate variables like uh, the precipitation anomalies. So what we can do here is very easily change the variable to the standardized precipitation index or the SPI. And we can um, select a custom time period um, where we can look at the time period prior to the um, fire outbreak by changing the custom time period here. And what we've outlined here in this example is to um, select 04, 01, so April 1st to July 1st. And then we're gonna click on Get Map Layer. Now you can see the standardized precipitation index. So this is also an index that uses precipitation anomalies. Um, and you can see in the um, red regions um, is a 
lower than average precipitation. If you click here along the yellow question mark, you can get more information about um, the SPI and its uh, US drought monitor categories. So you can see that much of this region was an exceptional or extreme drought. Um, so really prone to um, a fire outbreak here. Another thing I wanted to mention is that along the variables and the data set, you have these yellow question marks where you can get more information about things like what is a standardized precipitation index. And it provides you with links to do some of your own research as well. So for a, a, a variety of these variables, you might want to go ahead and take a look at that. You can also look at things like the SPEI, which includes um, evaporation in the index. And you can take a look at the um, map layer here by again clicking on get map layer. And we can see similar patterns, maybe a little less extreme when including the evapotranspiration. Um, but you have the option to look at these various um, drought indices as well. We can also take a look at the North American Drought Monitor, which is a cooperative effort between Canada, Mexico, and the United States. So along um, our get map or make map layer um, panel here, we can change the data set to the North American Drought Monitor. And then we can take a look at the drought classification, ensure that the statistic is the mean, and the calculation is the values. And then again, for our time period, we're gonna take a look at the last June, July, August and click on get map layer. And here you can see that um, the, the drought is, the classification for the North American drought monitor is a little bit um, less severe. Again, we can click on get map value and show this for our particular region of interest. And here you can see that the value um, is uh, 2.3. And in this classification system, a, uh, a positive value indicates more severe drought. Um, so you can, again, um, see what these de designations are. So another variable that we discussed in the lecture is temperature. Um, so now we'll, we'll take a look at some temperature parameters um, during this time period. And again, for this fire in particular, temperature was a really big driving force in the, the fire outbreak. So um, what you can do here um, is click on reset along the top, and this will bring you right back to all of the parameters of the map that are default when you very first come to the application, including even the, the, the tour here. So, um, I recommend using this also if you have issues with your map loading um, and processing, maybe timing out. Um, so you can always use this to, to reset. Um, again, we'll come to Lytton, Canada as our um, place of interest where we want to center our map. We can change the base map. Let's try one out. Like um, you could try the road map. You can take a look at terrain. Let's just go for the road map again. And here along the, the panel, we are going to keep the climate and hydrology. We're going to again use our NLDAS2, our reanalysis. And for this, we're going to take a look at max temperature. Um, so this is the variable that came up. Um, as the default, we're going to look at the mean and we're going to look at the difference from average conditions as a starting point. And again, we're going to take a look at the last June, July, August. And click get map layer.
Okay, so now we can see as before, our maximum temperature difference um, from average is higher than average. Um, again, we can use the get value option to show the value in Linton. And here you can see that the um, value in the last June, July, August was um, nearly 2.5 degrees Celsius hotter than average. Um, so this is quite significant. Um, another optional step here is to take a look at the um, temperature differences from um, a different uh, climate model. Um, you can take a look at the CF. FS3 analysis or MERA2. Um, and let's also now take a look at the um, temperature anomalies in the days preceding the fire. So um, just in a shorter time window um, where this was really uh, a severe um, change in the temperature. So we're going to go down here in time period and do a custom date range. And we're going to do 2021-6-1 um, as our as six. 28 as our starting date and then 630 as our ending date. So we're just going to look at um, June 28th, 29th and 30th in the, the days that um, led up to this fire. And now um, get map value or get map layer. So now if we use our get value option again, um, we can take a look at the maximum temperature difference from average in our area. And here you can see it was nearly 15.8 degrees Celsius hotter than average in these two days. So, wow, that is really severe. Um, and you can take a look at the temperature anomalies um, in the whole region, if you zoom out as our optional step um, to, to take a look at that heat dome that affected much of the Western and, and Northeastern US and Canada. Um, so now we're going to go ahead and take a look at soil moisture, another variable we discussed in our lecture. We're gonna keep the climate and hydrology type. And for our data set, we are gonna use the FLDAS. So um, here we're going to just change this, um, and go down to land surface. And again, you can get more information on, on what these um, data sets are using the little um, yellow question mark there. Okay, so now we are going to take a look at soil moisture, another variable that we discussed as having an impact on fires. So what we're going to do is just change our data set here to FLDOS, which is a, a land surface model here. and what the variable will be as the default is the surface soil moisture. Um, we're gonna keep the statistic as the mean and the difference from average as the calculation. What we are going to do now is change the um, date range to the last June, July, August. So taking a look at what we had before and then click on get map layer. Okay, so now you can see that the surface soil moisture in this region is, is variable. It tends to be a little lower than average. Again, we can use the get value option to show the value in Litton. And you can see that this is um, about 1.2 millimeters less than average. So um, it was dry in this region. Um, it, prior to the fires during the last June, July, August. You can also look at soil moisture in you know, the months preceding. So you can take a look at the spring soil moisture um, as an optional step as well. So now we're going to take a look at the wind speed and we're gonna go back to our NLDOS2 as our data set, the reanalysis here. And the variable, we will take a look at wind speed. And now um, we have units, they can be um, in uh, meters per second or miles per hour. 
depending on what you prefer, we're going to look at miles per hour here. The statistic um, is going to uh, change to the maximum. So the maximum wind speed and the calculation will be values. And here we're going to look at our um, more specific date range, our custom date range of 628, June 28th to July 2nd. So um, actually after the fire had began. Now we're going to click on Get Map Layer. And here you can see the, um, the wind speeds. We can click on Get Value again for, for Litton. And here um, for our model, uh, we have wind speeds of about 10 miles per hour, um, which is pretty low for the region. Um, however, some of the ground stations measured wind speeds of nearly 45 mi miles per hour. So this might have occurred at higher elevations along peaks um, and in particular in regions um, where, the, where the fire was, was spreading rapidly. Um, so another thing to take a look at, but here in particular, as winds are so variable, it's oftentimes very useful to take a look at the ground measurements as well. Okay, so now we're moving on to part two, looking at some of the pre-fire landscape characteristic, characteristics. And here in um, Climate Engine, there are fewer options available, but we do have an option to look at a terrain base map so we can get sort of an idea of what the terrain looks like. Um, what I'm gonna do here is again, just reset. I recommend doing this often because um, a lot of times you are going through a lot of the processing and it, the maps can get a little hung up if you're doing the same thing over and over again. So. I prefer doing a little reset. And then we can take a look at Lytton, Canada again and center our map. And now what we can do is under map, we can change our base map to terrain. And while this isn't a perfect example of, of what the elevation looks like in particular regions, we can see that this is a mountainous region just based on this terrain map. Um, also, if you zoom in, you can start to see some of the um, topographic uh, lines. So you can see this is a complex mountainous terrain. Um, and yeah, if you zoom in really far using the plus or minus sign, you can start to see some of the contour lines that indicates the elevation. So you can see ridge lines, canyons, and regions that are covered in vegetation and regions that are more bare. Um, so in Google Maps, you can also click on um, some of these regions and get an idea of um, what's going on. So if we click on one of the, the peaks, um, also get more information uh, about a, the elevation. So if we zoom in here and uh, we zoom into Lytton here, we can take a look at these different peaks. In my example, I took a look at um, Mount Roach in the exercise, but we can also just click on any of these um, peaks here and get a little bit more information and view in Google Maps. So if we view it in Google Maps, we can um, get more information about the mountain and a lot of times the topography in this region as well. So here in Google Maps, you can see things like the elevation at nearly 3000 meters um, for these peaks. So it's a very high elevation region. So now if we go back to our Climate Engine app, um, the next thing we'll take a look at is the vegetation health. And we can do this by taking a look at um, some of our vegetation indices. Um, so again, we are going to um, use our panel here on the left. We are going to this time take a look at remote sensing data. So this is another option. Um, you see when I change remote the type to remote sensing, the data set here automatically changes to Landsat. 
What we're going to take a look at is Sentinel-2 in this example in Sentinel-2 surface reflectance. And we have our NDVI, which is the normalized difference vegetation index, as our vegetation index selected. We're going to take a look at the uh, mean and the values. And for the time period, we're going to take a look at the last northern water year. And then click on Get Map Layer. Okay, so now you can see the NDVI value in this region. Um, you can see that much of the region has dense vegetation, um, in the, especially in the lower elevations along the waterways with less, dead, less vegetation along the um, mountain peaks. So now we're gonna just make sure that our map is um, sort of centered back on Lytton. We can zoom out a little bit. And when we do that, um, the processing will, uh, expand to the larger region as you can see here. Um, while this is useful, it doesn't really say much about the health of the vegetation. Um, so what we're going to take a look at now is the um, percent of average conditions. So we're going to keep Sentinel-2 and NDVI selected. Then we're going to take a look at the calculation being the percent of average conditions. And we're going to change our time period to the last March through May. So this is the springtime preceding the fires. And we're gonna click on Get Map Layer. Now you can see that much of this region had below average NDVI values um, as indicated in the um, oranges and reds. We can also do this for the um, time period just prior to the fire and during the fire outbreak. So we can take a look at this in the last June, July, August. And again, click on Get Map Layer. And again, we see a lower than average NDVI values in this region. So now we are going to take a look at the vegetation moisture conditions. So we're going to take a look at the NDWI um, to identify variations in moisture content in the vegetation in this region. So here, we're just going to change the variable to um, the NDWI, and we're just going to choose the near infrared and shortwave infrared, this first option. There are a variety of ways to calculate this index, which we won't discuss here, but just select the first one for this example. And then um, we are going to ensure that the statistic is the mean, the calculation are the values, and then um, we are going to take a look at the typical NDWI values in this region. So we're going to take a look at the entire period of record and click on Get Map Layer. Okay, so now you can see the um, typical vegetation moisture conditions. And if we take a look at the um, get value, um, if you use that option again and navigate around, you'll see that the values range from about um, negative 0.1 to 0.6. And again, really vary based on the elevation and the aspect. So what we can also do, like we did with the other indices, is take a look at the difference from average conditions. And we can just take a look at the last June, July, August, and click on Get Map Layer. And now you can see that um, the vegetation moisture difference from average is a little below average, in particular in the region around Lytton, um, in particular where the fire has actually occurred. Um, so just another uh, way to assess pre-fire um, vegetation health. 
So now we are going to take a look at um, a really new and cool feature in Climate Engine is uh, fire danger. So we talked about the fire weather index as a component of the Canadian Forest Fire Weather Index. And um, again, it's it's based on these, these variety of indices that use things like temperature, precipitation, humidity. Um, again, we're just gonna reset our map as a starting point. And then we're gonna zoom into Lytton Canada again to center our map. And just type in Lytton Canada and center our map. We are going to go ahead and change our base map to terrain again. And now we are going to take a look at climate and hydrology. And our data set, we are going to take a look at the MARA 2 reanalysis. And in this uh, analysis, we have the fire weather index as an option. And this is an option available just for um, the US and portions of Canada. So this will not be available for all of your regions, but it's a great example for, for this area. For the statistic, we are going to um, look at our maximum. And the calculation will be the values. And again, we're going to take a look at the last June, July, August and click on Get Map Layer. Interestingly enough, um, the fire weather index ranges from about 20 to 60 across the region and is not that intense for some of the regions surrounding Lytton, but um, is a pretty high value. Um, just north of the town here um, and in some of the surrounding regions. As an optional step, you can take a look at the custom date range option and look at how the fire weather index changes in a custom date range, say the couple days preceding the fire. Um, you might see um, some differences there. So do take a, take a look at that as an option if you'd like. So that concludes our climate engine portion of this exercise. We are going to um, now briefly take a look at Natural Resources Canada, and then we'll take a look at the Global Wildfire Information System. It won't be as extensive as our climate engine portion, but it does provide a few examples here. So now we are going to go ahead and take a look at the um, Canadian Wildland Fire Information System. And again, um, this is a great resource provided by Natural Resources Canada for fire mapping. Um, I provided the link there in the exercise document. So if you're following along with us, you'll be navigated to this link that I've already pulled up in my browser. Um, here you can get a lot of information about the um, forest fire weather index, what we've been talking a lot about. Um, and then on the, the left-hand side here, they have this option for an interactive map. So we can go ahead and click on that. And we provided an example of what this map looks like in our um, lecture. But here we can go ahead and um, change our dates to our date of interest. We're gonna go ahead and take a look at June 28th of 2021. And then we're going to click on Retrieve Map. It's a very simple interface, but it has a lot of nice information. Along the top right, if we click on Overlays here, we can expand our map options so we can see what we have available. Um, again, this is just focused on Canada, but it has a lot of examples um, and a lot of information. You can see initially our fire danger is turned on and we were down here in British Columbia and you can see again the fire danger was very high um, in the couple days preceding the fire outbreak. If you want you can zoom in and um, navigate over to this area and take a little closer look. Um, and we were really right in this region here. 
Um, you can also turn on the fire history layer and see how it compares with the regions that are under a high fire danger currently. So you can turn these layers on and off. Um, you can take a look at the um, fire, fire history, um, fire danger. So um, the fire history shows you fire perimeters from 1980 to 2020. Um, you can see some very large fires happening here, um, portions of the um, Canadian Rockies um, and a variety of other things. So you can zoom in and take a look at those past fire um, perimeters of interest. Now, while we're not focused on active fire mapping for this training, um, again, as I mentioned, many of these tools have multiple data sets available. So what we can do is we can change the date to um, July 2nd. So we'll come here to the 2nd of July of 2021, and we can um, retrieve the map. And again, look at the overlays and take a look at the active fires. So we can take a look at the fire 3M hotspots and this will pull up um, the hotspots areas for the, the fires that occurred in the last 24 hours. And if we zoom in, we can find our fire of here um, with these dots. So there are many fires that occurred around, around Lytton. Um, and if you click on the map, you can get more information there. Um, the NRC website also provides seasonal fire forecast maps, such as the um, National Wildland Fire Situation Report and historical analysis of fire danger. Um, so if you go um, along the top of the web page here um, and click on fire, you can find some of this information. So here you can read through the background information provided um, and scroll to the bottom of the web page to find out more um, about all of the information that they have. Um, but you can also here, click here on the Canadian Wildland Fire Information System. And here's where you can view those maps that we showed in our lecture as well. So there are things like fire weather, fire behavior, and the fire hotspots. So if you click on any of these in particular, you can um, be taken to those pre-populated and pre-created maps um, available. Um, you can also take a look at various data sources uh, on this website, such as things like the burned area um, composites, fire polygons, smoke plumes, and, and many, many more things. So this is a great resource if your area is in, in Canada that you're focused on. Um, so I do encourage you all to um, take a deeper dive into um, Natural Resources Canada website for a variety of the tools and resources that they have for you. So that was a really, really brief um, highlight of the um, Canadian information from Natural Resources Canada. And in the final portion of our exercise, we are again going to look very briefly at the Global Wildland uh, wildfire Information System, or GWIS, because it does have a little bit of information in our sort of pre-fire analysis. So again, this is part five. If you're following along, we have the um, GWIS website shown here um, that we are going to take a look at. So now if we scroll to the bottom of the, the initial web page, um, we can take a look at the long-term fire weather forecast. Um, if we take a look at the, uh, here, global long-term fire weather forecast. Here you can take a look at um, many different regions of interest. Um, here we're going to take a look at North America. So we'll go ahead and select the North American region. It's centered over, at, over Europe um, because this is a um, joint um, ESA produced tool. So they do have a focus there on Europe, but we can take a look at North America. And here you can see the monthly and seasonal maps of temperature and rainfall anomalies. So we have a monthly option, we have a seasonal option. Um, so in 
future fires, um, future analysis that you're doing, you can take a look at the, the uh, long-term monthly forecasts in your region. We can also look retrospectively at the various fire danger data layers available in the current situation viewer. So at the top of the web page, we can take a look at the apps and we can look at the current situation viewer. With the current situation viewer, there are various map options and forecast layers um, along the left-hand side once this loads. And you can, you can navigate through this map really easily. So what we can do here is um, we can move our region and zoom in to our area where we were interested in in British Columbia and take a look at some of these layers as well. So now we can take a look at um, the forecast tab. So if we take a look at the forecast tab, we see fire danger forecast here, and we can take a look at June 28th, 2020, our time period of interest. So just by using this navigation to go backwards and click on June 28th. And we are just going to take a look first at the um, fire danger forecast. So we can go ahead and turn this on. And now we can see the um, fire danger rating, similar to what we were viewing in our Climate Engine website, although this is um, available globally. So you can, again, you can zoom out of the map and see this in many portions of the world. Um, during this time period, I mentioned the, the heat dome. So much of the Western US, as well as British Columbia, were um, under this uh, fire warning, fire, fire danger was very high. And we can take a look at um, the table of the fire danger forecast to see what this really means, what the values mean. Um, so the other options available here as well are some of the uh, variables that tie into the fire weather index, like the initial spread, the built up index, the fine fuel moisture code, you can take a look at all of these different layers. Again, we have an information icon, and this is very similar to the yellow question mark that we had in Climate Engine, where you can take a look at what these values mean. So you can see the fire danger classes and the fire uh, weather index ranges and what they mean. And we've included this table in the exercise as well. So you can take a look at what the colors are and then where the fire danger rates um, along the map as well. So if we go back to our current situation viewer, again, I mentioned a variety of indices here. We can take a look at things like the initial spread index and our map will change and populate automatically. And we can zoom into our region of interest to get this information. You can also look at things like the fine fuel moisture code. And we can see that the fuels were very dry during this period um, prior to, to the outbreak. Um, so there are a lot of different data sets available in GWIS. Um, in particular, there's a, a lot available for actively burning fires. Um, they do also have some burnt area um, data products available. So I do encourage you to explore this in a bit more detail. Um, and we will be exploring this with our second exercise. So do take a look at that and um, take a look at the Global Wildfire Information System. So I know that was a really brief overview, especially of our second um, and third web portals for uh, pre-fire information. Um, but this concludes the exercise for our Lytton Canada firebreak, fire outbreak example. You can see in a variety of ways that the conditions were prime for a really large fire to occur. Now, I've just stepped through our first exercise here, um, but we do have a second exercise focused on our Bolivia fire examples that looks very similar to what we've gone through here um, for our, our Canada example. So 
I encourage you all to spend the time during our lab time to, to go through that second example, and we'll be here for um, questions that you have along the way. Um, and I do just want to thank you all for being with us today. So we'll wrap up our exercise here, um, and then we'll we'll get to some question and answer session, and then we'll we'll be around for for questions for um, quite a while um, after the conclusion of this. So um, thank you all, and um, we will now move into our question and answer portion. All right, so thanks again, everyone, for joining us. Uh, give us a moment, we're going to pull up our Q&A document. Uh, a few things I wanted to make note of uh, straight off the bat is uh, I realized with so many users online here, um, we have nearly 700 of you today. It looks like we may be overloading the Climate Engine website. So you may have difficulty, you may be seeing an error uh, when you go to the Climate Engine website when you're trying to load um, specific when you get to the, um, to the initial site. So uh, with large groups of participants um, going on to these sites, we're, we're in a learning process. So apologies uh, if you're unable to access Climate Engine now. Um, I will say that you can come back and um, access Climate Engine at any point. Um, you have the documents with the step-by-step -step instructions there for you. Um, and you also will have access to view the recording of the, uh, in particular, the Canada example that we just stepped through. Um, that'll be made available on the RSET website within a couple of days. So you could always come back um, and test out these features. Um, and I know we also had a few questions specific to Climate Engine that uh, I'll get to later on as well. Um, so what we'll do now is we'll go through questions um, until about the top of the hour um, as needed. Uh, as we see some questions coming in, we can answer those as well. Um, and then we'll, we'll take a pause and, and um, maybe we'll see if we're able to get onto Climate Engine and, and you could work through some of those exercises um, until uh, the, the top of the, the next hour. So let's just go ahead and jump right into a few of these questions. Um, some of these were coming in during the lecture portion, so they're more specific to some of the topics we were discussing. Uh, the first question here that's shown is, um, what about anthropogenic factors? Where does this factor in? And that's a really great question. And I would say that that anthropogenic influences on the, the climate and the ecosystem um, can be folded into many of these variables that we discussed during the lecture. Um, you know, for example, we see increased temperatures or changes in precipitation variability and uh, frequency and severity of storms. Um, as a result of climate change. And so um, we can see anthropogenic influences on the climate in terms of those variables as we're looking at things like differences from average, um, in particular, when we're pulling from a long-term 30-year uh, climatology. We can also assess changes to um, the land cover and forest structure due to anthropogenic influences. So looking at things like uh, forest clearing, um, agricultural expansion, urban growth, um, and looking at a time series of imagery uh, over the, a particular area of interest as uh, human influences the landscape. So we mentioned land cover classification in the lecture. So you could do something like this as um, looking at uh, calculating your own land cover classification over many years and seeing how those classes change. Um, you could also look at uh, changes in things like the NDVI um, over time. And, and, and in, in that you can identify uh, land clearing um, and um, changes to the health that may be related to anthropogenic influences. Um, so, so I would say that there are a variety of factors that you can take into consideration when, when looking at these variables that we considered um, in the lecture 
that can attribute to fire risk. Um, there are also many other factors. Um, and, and one thing we didn't talk a lot about that is a, a growing area of concern is, is something like the urban wildland interface and the encroachment of, of these large wildfires on um, what used to be pretty safe areas where, where folks are living. Um, and so that, that is another area of, of study in terms of, of risk to communities and risk to structures. Um, so that's something to consider as well. I will say um, in response to looking at for structure, and there was another question later on about this as well, um, using SAR data is really beneficial um, to look at things like structure and density of forests. And um, I've linked, I've provided the link to a training that we gave last year on forest mapping with SAR data. And we had um, another RSET trainer, trainer Erica Potis, who is our resident SAR expert online for that training. We also had a guest speaker um, who talked about forest stand height there. And so that's another area to explore in terms of assessing changes to forests due to anthropogenic activities. Okay, so um, moving on to question two. Um, this question asks, um, why always after a wildfire event, the same vegetation types and densities that were burnt come back to colonize the same area? Um, and if we could just scroll down, thank you, on the document a bit there. Um, so that's a great question. And um, it also might depend on your area and the vegetation um, of interest within a region that was recently burnt. But um, vegetation regrowth patterns can vary. Um, oftentimes you do see the same types of vegetation and, and, and that can be a real function of the fact that wildfire is a natural part of the ecosystem and contributes generally to the health of, of many forests, um, particularly um, conifer-based forests where the, the fires uh, will open up the, the um, seeds of the, the trees and actually create the conditions necessary for um, new, new trees and regrowth um, in that region. So um, this, is, this is a really natural part of the system. You know, in relation to the previous question, we are seeing these, these more severe wildfires occurring um, that may be related to changes that are anthropogenically produced. And so um, we are seeing um, sort of unnatural fire regimes in, in many of these forests. And, um, that, that can relate to the way the forest is managed, that can relate to climate change and climate variability and, and a variety of other factors. Um, but we do often see some of the same vegetation types and, and that can be due to the vegetation itself. It also can be due to the, the climate and um, topographic conditions that are present um, in the region and, and also the influence of human activity um, and um, restoration uh, activities also in the area. I know that um, in, in many portions where wildfires have burned, there are efforts uh, by uh, groups like the US Forest Service to um, restore that area to the um, natural um, system. So there are a variety of factors that are um, in place there. Okay, um, question three. Interesting question here. Um, how can wildfire affect groundwater conditions, groundwater changes? Um, and, and again, that also depends on the severity of the fire. But as we mentioned in the lecture, um, the soil conditions of a region that have been impacted by wildfire can, can change drastically. And this can modify the, um, the soil particles, um, the space within the, the soil, um, the structure of the soil itself. So oftentimes this can influence things like recharge rates, where in severely burned regions, the soil structure has been destroyed and infiltration is not occurring as readily um, as it would um, naturally. So this could <clears throat> decrease infiltration rates. This could um, you know, lead to less recharge potentially happening to, to the groundwater. Um, and again, it, it, it can be uh, very homogenous and variable depending on your region. Um, but if 
if, for example, you have an extreme wildfire event and um, the soil is destroyed or the soil has been impacted severely, um, infiltration could decrease. So you could have less recharge to those aquifers. Um, and also the wildfires can lead to increase in runoff in a watershed due to the lack of the vegetation, um, leading to things like landslides, which can heavily impact the uh, watershed, um, as well as um, the surface water in the region, thinking about water quality and, and sediment loading and things like that. And um, I also wanted to mention that in part five of our previous fires training that we held last summer, um, it focuses on um, hydrology-based applications, um, so assessment of the watershed post-fire. Um, so do take a look at that. We have um, our great uh, water resources trainers who gave that um, session um, provided some more information about that as well. Okay, um, if we scroll down to question four, the question is, what are some examples of heavy fuels? Another great question. Um, heavy fuels can be things like large tree branches, logs, buildings, and these generally are considered to require more energy. Um, and they, they once, but once, Sorry, right, everyone, I believe my audio um, was lost there for a moment, but I hopefully am back now. Um, it looks like my speaker is working again. Maybe some connectivity issues on my end. Um, but I was referring to this question four about heavy fuels. I've also included um, some examples of light fuels, um, things like grasses, grasses and shrubs, and, and as well as um, thinking about uh, ladder fuels and what those, what those mean. So there's a great resource um, from uh, the Forest Service. I've provided the link there. It's a, it's a little fact sheet that talks about um, fuel, different fuel types um, for wildfires. Okay, um, question five. This question um, is asking to account for multi-year drought events, instead of starting or ending the fire season on fixed dates, could remote sensing be used to assess landscape con conditions, such as soil moisture, evapotranspiration, vegetation indices, to determine a um, temporarily dynamic fire season? And the answer there is yes. We saw that with some of our climate engine example. Um, you can assess these variables via remote sensing and climate models um, for multiple different time scales. And um, you can select, in Climate Engine in particular, the, the benefit of that is um, the ability to select different time periods um, and run that analysis and make the maps in real time uh, to whatever kind of time period you're interested in. Now, that is to say you are limited by the remote sensing record in terms of your time period of interest. Um, you're limited by um, the, when the satellite was launched um, the, and the temporal resolution of satellite overpasses in a region. So um, you have to consider that if you're thinking about assessing um, you know, historic wildfires or even into the future as some of the um, satellite sensors um, may be decommissioned. Um, so that's something to consider as well. Um, but yes, uh, the short answer is yes, and you can assess things at different time scales. Um, you can also look at anomalies of these variables as we saw um, using something like a 30 year climatology. We often um, look at something like 1980 to 2010 um, as the, the average, and then you, you pull the anomalies off of that, that climatological average. And there are issues with that, of course, as well, but that's a, a good estimate to use um, in terms of seeing how different the current conditions are from, from normal. 
Okay, so uh, moving on to question six. How can individual height of trees be calculated through SAR without LIDAR data or 3D data? Is it possible from a Sentinel-1 image to achieve this? And, and, uh, and the short answer there is no. Um, Sentinel-1 data, it's, it's very difficult to identify individual trees as far as I understand it. And I will caveat that with saying I am not a SAR expert. Um, I am more of an op optical person. So some of you online may even be more well versed in the use of SAR data than, than I am. But I would say that you can estimate forest stand height more generally for um, regional forest areas. And we have covered this in a recent RSET training. I've also linked to our um, uh, our RSET SAR training that I mentioned um, that we, we gave last year on, on forest, uh, estimating forest uh, height. So we had our final lecture for that one, I believe it was the session four, was um, fo focused on the use of SAR data for forest and height, gave some examples from the um, Eastern US. We had a great guest speaker online for that training. So I would say take a look at that for um, more of those technical details about estimating um, tree height and forest stand height through the use of SAR data. It is a, it is a really important component when thinking about wildfire activity um, if you're interested on the dynamics and a, on a really small scale um, or you know, very specific area of interest. Um, so I will say that, that it's a useful piece that we didn't um, cover in much depth um, during this training, but we have some other resources available for you there. Okay, um, so the next question is an interesting question, and I honestly didn't know the answer right offhand, and it might take a little bit more investigation. Um, but the question is, what resolution does the FWI have so that the fire weather index? And it does depend on the data in which you are using to calculate those other indices like the initial spread index and the depth and moisture code, um, the, the variables that go into that calculation are going to define the spatial scale. Um, we've provided a link there um, about uh, more information on the fire weather index there. Um, but I will say in doing a little bit of investigation, there's another great um, website that we didn't mention much um, here um, but it's called a resource watch. And you may be familiar with it um, through the use of looking at other data sets, but one of, the, one of the data sets that they have on resource watch is the fire weather index. And this is actually um, a global fire weather database. And it's uh, processed and run by uh, some folks at NASA Goddard and in, in that data set that they provide on Resource Watch, they state that the um, global daily calculations of the FWI system using these inputs, such as relative humidity, temperature, wind speed, a variety of variables, they are uh, providing the data from 2015 to present at a one degree resolution. So that's gonna really depend on um, where you are in the world, a 0.1 degree resolution, what that looks like in terms of, of um, kilometers. Um, but that's what they have provided as some of the details there. Um, and we can certainly provide a link to resource watch um, in the Q&A for reference later as well. Um, it's not explicit on the Canadian website anywhere that I found. <laughs> So um, that's a really good question. Okay, um, I think we can go and answer a couple more questions and then maybe um, see how, how we're going with, with Climate Engine to see if anyone is able to access it, if we should um, give some time for lab time or have folks try to access it at a later date. Uh, looks like it's loading for me. I just tried it again. So, but we'll go through a few more of these questions. Um, so the next question asks, is there a relationship between fires and El Nino and La Nina? And the, the short answer is yes. Um, ENSO, or the El Nino Southern Oscillation, um, affects temperature and precipitation patterns globally. 
Um, so depending on your region of interest and depending on the phase of ENSO, if it's in a La Nina or an El Nino, um, this could impact the, uh, the conditions that um, can influence wildfire outbreaks. So for California, for example, um, when we when we are in a La Nina, we generally see decreased precipitation, especially in the northern por portions of California, and that can lead to um, increased drought and um, conditions that may be more prone for wildfire outbreaks. Um, and in other regions of the world, uh, the phase of ENSO may change those precipitation and, and temperature patterns in uh, different ways. So um, just depending on where you are in the world and the, the current phase, um, it can definitely impact wildfires. Um, I also wanted to mention that in our Bolivia example, we didn't talk through it too much today, um, but research has, has shown that um, the outbreak that occurred in 2020 in Bolivia may have been um, uh, largely impacted due to the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation, another climate oscillation, the AMO. Um, it's a longer scale uh, climate oscillation, so it stays within one phase uh, for longer periods of time. Um, but they are currently in a phase that results in uh, warmer and drier conditions in Bolivia. And they have been for, for many years at this point. And so there, they, there is research that suggests that the um, outbreaks in 2019 and 2020 um, may be partially related to this um, phase of uh, the climate oscillation there. Um, I've also linked a paper on uh, the global effects of ENSO on wildfires um, that I found in doing some quick search. Um, so do take a look at that. Um, for more information there. Okay, the next question, question nine, is there any agency-led effort to develop, to develop new fire weather indices? The short answer to that is maybe, and I just might not be aware of it. Um, as NASA, we're, we're not necessarily an operational agency, um, so we're really focused on the use of data and the dissemination of data um, through trainings and things like that. So there quite possibly could be, and I'm just not aware of it. I will say that the US Forest Service and USGS uh, work together to produce data and to serve data on fire danger. Um, and I'm sure there are other efforts that I'm just not aware of. Maybe some of you online know, know about other efforts. Um, I, I did find this uh, resource on uh, the USGS Forest Service Fire Danger Forecasting Project um, that's really focused on the dissemination of some of um, the, the fire danger data. Um, and also I will say it might depend on your, your area. Um, I'm sure globally there are efforts within countries and agencies in different regions to assess fire danger. Um, so um, short answer there is probably, <laughs> and I'm not aware of specifics myself. So, um, okay, so I think the next couple of questions start to focus a little bit more on climate engine. So I'll um, answer a few of these as, as I can here. Um, for question 10, the question is, are you able to customize your search preferences within the variable? For example, I'm interested in the percentage of time for June, July, August. Uh, I think they're referring to maybe a step in the exercise, um, 28C. Let's see what 28. Um, I'm not sure what that, that variable is offhand, but I will say that depending on the variable of interest, if you go to um, your processing, it's actually, I, uh, it's actually under processing and then calculation, I wrote statistic there, but under calculation, you have a, a variety of options for um, running different statistics. So you can do things like just the total values, but you can also do things like the difference from average, the percent difference from average, percent of average, um, and you can also look at slope um, and correlation 
um, for a variety of different things. So uh, the answer there is yes, there are some statistics that you can use that are pre-programmed within Climate Engine that are there for you, depending on your um, variable of, of interest. Um, and you can just take a look at those options in the under processing and then calculation on the, the left-hand panel there in Climate Engine. Okay, so if we scroll down to question 11, Can we use all of these analyses, analysis results as a server service to download them further? Oh, yes. So if you are making a map, there are a couple of different options here. So if you're making a map, you can go along the top hand panel and go to download and you can select a rectangular image and then download um, the map, download that um, square or the rectangular image as a geotiff. You can also download it as a PDF. And, um, and I will say the other option that you have is if you are making a graph, which is something we didn't go through for the Canada example, but we have a brief bit of that in the Bolivia um, example, where you um, can make a graph for a particular region and then download the data as a CSV or a PNG. And then you can you know, export it uh, as you'd like and use it in other software as well. Um, I did see one comment uh, in the questions that um, somebody was having an issue with the way the data were downloading, like the, um, I believe that the, the entire rectangle, maybe data weren't being downloaded for the entire area that they selected. Um, I'm not aware of that as a, a common issue. Um, but that might be a question to ask the um, climate engine developers. Um, so um, we could take a look at their website and see if there is a, a like help email to ask them about that. Uh, that's not something I'm specifically aware of, um, but that might be an issue um, either based on a lot of folks trying to access climate engine right now, or um, maybe a common um, bug that they're seeing uh, on the site, I'm not sure. Um, but you do have some uh, options there in terms of downloading data as GeoTIFF. Uh, okay, so the next question, have you had any luck downloading or analyzing the hazard layer um, in Climate Engine? Do we need to process or treat them differently given that they're usually somewhat static? Right, um, I, that's not something I've really looked at much. I know that it's a newer feature um, on Climate Engine and uh, and it includes, but it does include a lot of interesting variables like burn probability, um, uh, risk to potential structures, which is probably a relatively more static um, calculation. If you do go to, I will say, um, if you do go to the, little qu yellow question mark on the make map panel, you can click on um, the, uh, the data set and get some information on the metrics, um, in particular, the wildfire risk to communities uh, data sets there. And um, the, these data are primarily serviced through land fire. And it does mention that they, um, some of the data, like the fuel loading data set, is from 2014. So as you mentioned, that is a more static um, layer. Um, so yes, I think you would need to, depending on what you're using the data for in your analysis, um, really keep that in mind of what the, um, you know, when the, those data are representative of the landscape conditions and co in comparison to maybe some of the climate variables or the, the variables that are changing um, uh, on a shorter time scale and how um, that relates. So I will say that um, those data sets were created by the Forest Service and um, they can be accessed mostly, I think, through land fire as well. So you can get more information about um, each individual and what year it was produced and, and how it represents 
um, the, the landscape for that given time period. Um, but that, that's a really good question. Um, and also a good, a good comment about comparing data that are changing more rapidly alongside data that are not. So if you're looking at things like topography and slope and aspect, um, that's not going to change much. Um, but then when you're, when you're also uh, tying in the factors um, like precipitation anomalies, um, the, they are changing at different time scales. So it's a good point and something to keep in mind um, as you're analyzing risk in your region. Question 13 is a really interesting question, and I will say it just varies depending on what type of data that you're looking at. Um, so it, the question is, who provides the data for each of the search engines, groups, organization, weather bureaus, forestry, NASA, NOAA, ESA, how is it verified? Great question. So um, it depends on the variable of interest. Like I just mentioned, this wildfire risk to communities layer is produced by the USDA Forest Service. Um, I will say that Climate Engine uses Google Earth Engine as um, the, the backend computing. So it, this is just a, essentially an API that's, that's uh, generated off of Earth Engine. And Earth Engine pulls data from a variety of different places, oftentimes pulling data directly from things like the distributed active archive centers or DACs. So for a lot of NASA produced data, um, the DACs are the official service um, repository for data, and they have uh, been um, QA, QC'd. They have all of the associated metadata. Um, there's a real clear process on how those data are um, taken from the, the sensor, processed, um, delivered into specific products, and they have a um, very specific process outlined on the DAX. Um, Climate Engine and, and Earth Engine is just essentially pulling that data um, through cloud computing um, from the places that the data are officially being served. So if you want more information on the, the quality of the data and, and all of that type of stuff, you would probably want to go to some place like the DAX. Um, one example of um, this interplay between these different agencies uh, in terms of delivery and service is uh, Landsat. It's a great example of a collaboration between NASA and the USGS. So um, NASA built, builds the satellite sensors, they launch the satellite. Once the satellite is up and running and data is being served, the USGS is the agency responsible for pulling the data, um, organizing it, processing it, generating specific products, and serving it. So this is a really, um, interesting connection between these different organizations. And so it really varies, um, you know, for a lot of the, the ESA satellites, um, it, it's more uh, uh, included within the whole ESA ecosystem. So most of the ESA uh, data, such as Sentinel-2, is provided through the Copernicus DAC um, or data portal if you will, um, and that's also run by ESA itself. So it's a really complicated question, but it's really interesting um, to think about. So, um, and then and then I will say, you know, places like the Forest Service or different weather bureaus or even local state agencies might use data from NASA or USGS and then uh, create their own products. Um, and Land Fire is a great example of that where they are pulling in data from, you know, things like Landsat, but they are including their own data and expert uh, analysis to create different products as well and serve them through various locations. So great question, uh, complicated answer.
Okay. Uh, this is also a very good question. Um, 14 asks if um, they're wondering if the Bolivia data graph with increasing fire counts over time discriminates between wildfire and intentional fires for clearing. If not, would that be possible? I don't believe that it the graph that we were showing in the lecture discriminates uh, between that, whether or not it was intentionally created. Um, I did note in the Bolivia example that many of the fires that are seen in that region are um, used for clearing land uh, many times for agricultural purposes. So many of the fires in the region are, are anthropogenically produced and are serving the purpose of clearing land for agricultural production. It's the most common um, way to clear the dense forest um, in this region. And in some of the resources we provided on the Bolivia fires, they, they comment on that um, quite extensively that um, fires are seen as a normal part of the landscape, oftentimes due to this clearing activity and um, most, much of the land is, is um, locally owned. Um, and so the clearing is, is happening on a regular basis, but the fire outbreaks in 2019 and 2020 were um, more extensive than what was observed, what's observed on a normal year due to clearing. Um, I will say that I mentioned the um, severe Amazonia dashboard. And on that dashboard, they um, it's really focused on near real time monitoring of fires. Um, so not not necessarily this pre or post fire that we're talking about in this training series, but they um, they do uh, discriminate um, fires based on the, the what burn. I believe they uh, outline things like it's an understory burn, for example. Um, but I also don't think they discriminate between if it was if it's a purpose purposeful burn or if it's just a um, you know, wildfire incident that occurred due to you know, something like a um, lightning strike. Um, it's a really great, great question. Um, and I will say that there may be regions um, where there is some like local or state statistics on, on um, land clearing type burning, prescribed burns versus uh, wildfire events. Um, but that's probably dependent on your region, and I'm not aware of um, specifics on that. Very good question, though. Okay. Maybe I'll just go through a couple more questions. I see that we do have a few here that we haven't quite answered yet. Um, I'll go through a few of these, and then maybe I'll um, maybe we'll go to for a few more minutes, and then we'll pause here and allow you guys some time to sit quietly and go through the lab. It looks like Climate Engine is working again. Um, maybe fewer of you are actually online using it right now. Um, but I'll go through a few more and then I'll, I'll take a pause and um, we'll come back on as needed for answers to specific questions on the exercise. So um, the next question is lack of precipitation can increase stress in conifers. This can make them more vulnerable to fatal attacks by insects like western pine beetles, yes. Uh, does this increase fire risk outside of just the heat and lack of precipitation that the area is all already experiencing? Um, I would say yes. The uh, mountain pine beetle outbreak has been very extensive, in the, especially in the western U.S., in places like the um, California and Colorado and the Rockies and the Sierra. Um, and, and just as, as the question uh, mentioned, the mountain pine beetle attacks can um, be fatal to the trees, which and then in turn dries them out, which when a fire does come through can lead to 
um, increased spread. Um, the fuels then are drier. Um, they can that can increase ignition of fire and spread certainly in in these regions. And so it is this twofold risk that's occurring um, on on the forest where um, you know, the attack from the mountain pine beetle can then lead and make the region more susceptible to larger fires and provide more fuel, um, drier fuel, at least for the um, wildfire spread in this region. So it's a great point and um, another, another thing to, to think about. And, and I will say that uh, a couple of years ago, we did a training on um, uh, assessing uh, land cover changes using land trender, which is another um, sort of GUI built off of earth engine. And we looked at mountain pine beetle uh, infestation in Colorado and changes. We, I think we used NDVI, maybe NBR, to look at changes in the uh, forest health in that region. So that's certainly something else you could do is take a look at um, changes to vegetation health in regions that we know we have mountain pine beetle spread. Um, and you know, think about that in terms of the risk to, to wildfire um, in that region. Ooh, question 16 is a pretty specific question I don't think I have an answer to. It's asking, um, interested in your thoughts or experience in incorporating land fire into spread models um, for um, areas of interest in, um, in Earth Engine, I'm assuming, and workflows for export, exporting covariates or generating functional group ratios, um, similar for post recover monitoring. I honestly don't have specific experience with that. So um, unfortunately, I am unable to address that question um, specifically. Um, I certainly could ask some of my colleagues that may have more experience um, looking at spread models. Um, that's not something I've done, unfortunately. Uh, question 17. Um, is it possible to produce normalized burn ratio from pre and post fire data? Yes, we will do that next session very extensively. Um, so that'll be, uh, and I, I guess that's another uh, point for me to give as a plug for our next session. Um, we will be using Google Earth Engine more, more directly through JavaScripting through the um, Earth Engine coding interface to do pre and post NBR calculations and to create a, a burn severity map um, for both of these case studies. So we have an example from Linton, Canada, where we're looking at the same fire and then the Bolivia example as well. Um, so, so the short answer is yes, and stay tuned and, and do please come back for um, our session on Thursday, where we'll we'll do this in in much more depth. And and um, I will say, if you haven't done it already, um, acquiring an Earth Engine code editor account and at least opening that um, interface up and having a little bit of familiarity with it will be really beneficial for you. We're not going to be reviewing the the uh, sort of an intro to Earth Engine code editor. Um, we do have scripts available for you um, where you can run um, the analysis yourself, but I won't be going through sort of the, the basics, but there, there are a lot of resources for that um, on um, provided by Google uh, as well. So um, plug for that um, and, and so come back, come back Thursday. And we'll go through that in much more detail. But that is the way that we will analyze our um, post-fire impacts and burn severity. Um, OK, so I will go ahead um, now and take a little break. Um, I'll take a look at some of these other questions that we've come that have come through. Um, but I do want to give everyone a little bit of time to just sit quietly and work on the, the um, lab as, as they'd like. 
Um, and I'll come back if we see some common questions or you know, potentially do a little screen share if there are um, some issues around a certain variable or function um, with the exercises. Um, so I'll just pause here, uh, but we, I will remain, we will all remain online until the top of the hour. So just a little over 30 minutes if you'd like to work through anything. And um, in the meantime, I'll, I'll take a look at some of these other questions and um, pop on if need be. But I will say that our um, Q&A document will be made available to everyone. So for the questions I didn't get to live today, um, I will we'll be typing up our answers and we'll be posting that on the website. Um, so you can come back if, you're, if you, uh, your question is a little lower on the list here that we haven't gotten to yet, you can come back and take a look at that. Give us a little time, give us about a week or so to come back and edit this document and get it online for you. Um, but you'll be able to come back there as well. Um, and then of course the recording will be posted too. And then you have, um, for the two exercises today, you have that step-by-step -step guide that you can reference as well to get, to get through everything. So um, great, so I'll take a pause here. We'll remain online um, and you know, continue to feel free to ask questions as they come through. Um, and, and best of luck uh, working on the um, exercises for today. All right, everyone, um, this is Amber back again. Um, didn't see too many of the same types of questions with Climate Engine, so hopefully you all are working through the exercise just fine. Um, we are available via email. We've included our email addresses um, in the lecture. If you have additional questions um, about Climate Engine, or um, specifically pertaining to the exercises themselves. Um, we, we are available for that. Um, I also wanted to mention that um, do be prepared for part two um, on Thursday. Um, we are going to be working through an example using um, Earth Engine. So we'll be doing some, um, some coding with that. Uh, we will provide you with the scripts to go through them. Um, similarly to the way we organize today's session, we will have a lecture, then a little bit of Q&A, and then some time for um, you all to work um, independently and ask questions. Um, and then, of course, we can come on and show our screens if there are some common questions um, popping up. Um, I will say we also will be going through the um, Canada Fire example very explicitly on Earth Engine, and then we will leave you on your own to go through the Bolivia example, as we did with today's um, exercise as well. Um, so be prepared for that. Um, and then the, the um, link for the Earth Engine code is available on the presentation for Thursday's um, lecture as well. So you can access it that way. Um, I also wanted to mention that we will have one homework available, and it, I believe that is also on the website now. Um, so if you attend both sessions and um, complete the homework within two weeks of Thursday, um, then you can receive a certificate of completion for the course. So I wanted to make note of that. I'll mention it again um, on Thursday as well. It is a Google form with um, just a standard set of, of some questions um, that you can go through. And you're not being graded on that. It's, it's uh, just as, as long as you go through and answer those questions, you'll get some um, uh, feedback on, on the answers to those questions, but it's not uh, graded. So we are right at the top of the hour. Um, I, again, want to thank you all for joining us today. Um, I also, we welcome feedback on um, our different styles of our trainings. We're trying out some new things. We'd love feedback on what you all would like to see more of. Um, in the future too. So I'll be mentioning this next time, but we will have a survey that we'll be emailing out to you all at the end of the training um, that we'd love to get your feedback on for, for future trainings. Um, so thank you all again, and I look forward to being on with you uh, again on Thursday. So thanks and, and have a great day.